Hello. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. I was gone last week, so it's nice to be back. Uh, being gone for one week feels like a long time. So I want to talk today about my life in God's lens. Um, I've had a lot of interesting experiences this week. I was uh, had the opportunity to go to California last weekend. That's where I was at for a um, pastor's conference. And um, you know, I had some very eye-opening conversations in, in, during my time. I want to share about that uh, in a little bit. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this week was really crazy. There's so many things happening now, especially as we're getting closer to the start of the school year. Um, just last night, um, Heartland Academy did it had had a really wonderful welcome ceremony for all the new students coming and starting the year and all the families came up here and there was a line on the stage and all the families held hands and walked across the line together and put their handprint and thumbprints on this uh, canvas to signify like you know the new beginning and the commitment to the year. It was really beautiful, I thought, and uh, so. Uh, Things are just getting started for the new year, so that's going to be crazy. We also had the opportunity to go up to Wyoming and visit uh, the Love family. Some of you may know George and Maria Love. They're longtime members who live up in Laramie, and it was really nice. They hosted us for a couple days, and uh, they're a great couple. Yeah, um, and just as a side note, uh, not related to those things, but... I really would like, I really feel like I want to get started to start a music ministry soon, again. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> For too long, <laughs> we've been watching the same videos. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, but like getting a music ministry started is not easy. And we've had the experience of starting them and then, you know, not quite on the right foundation. They fall apart. And so, but I, I uh, and we've been trying for the last year or so to try to find um, couples who are really into doing music as a uh, as a ministry. Like they're talented, they're they love music, they love church, and to attract them to our community to help out with the band, but it has not panned out. So I'm I'm considering you know maybe we have enough talent hopefully in our community to pull something together even if maybe not every week but every other week or something like that so i'm i'm going to be starting to work on that so i just wanted to give you a heads up so when i was in the bay area i had the opportunity to talk with a past a person who used to be a pastor and i'm not i'm going to be i'm not going to be using any real names or um try to give anything away because, you know, since situations are sensitive and I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to cause grief to anybody. But he was sharing with me this story that really um, kind of uh, left a strong impression on me. He was telling me about how when he, he was asked to become the pastor of this community by their council, by especially a specific person on this council. And the expectation was that if he became the pastor, then he would make effort to sell this property that they had. And at that time, he didn't know much about the community or the um, feelings around the property, so he agreed and he said that was fine. But when he got there and time went by and he was pastoring this community, he found out that actually the, the members really loved this property and they don't really want to sell it. And so he had a change of heart because he didn't really have a strong opinion either way, but he felt, well, if my members want to keep this property, then, then you know, I want, to, I want to support them. I want to, you know, <laughs> unless there's a real important reason or something we direly need that money for, then he said, I, I don't want to sell it. And that caused a big problem. And he said that this person uh, who had a lot of authority and a lot of, what would you call, like, pull, influence, um, made his life very difficult and eventually got him kicked off 
uh, kick, not kicked off, but eventually had him removed as pastor for this one, for this one reason. And, uh, and he said that he never thought something like that would happen in our church. Um, he said, I was naive. You know, I thought we could just work it out. I thought that if I had the best interests of my members at heart, that we would be able to figure out some kind of something that would work for everybody. And unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Uh, he even tried to resign, and they were like, well, are we really going to accept his resignation? And so it left um, a lot of uh, hurt on his heart um, after that experience. And I really feel like these kinds of things really shouldn't happen in the church. That was really my feeling as I was listening to him. Like, this is the kind of thing you expect to find in, I don't know, corporate America. You know, like, it's like dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? People are stepping on top of each other to be able to get ahead. That's the kind of thing you expect to see maybe in that kind of a situation. But in a church, you, you kind of expect or at least hope that, you know, we all have the same goals and hopes and we, we're, we'll try to work things out as we go, right? And to see these kind of things happened, happening is, you know, disappointing. And, but at the same time, ha very much mirrored in some senses some of the experiences that we had a few years ago as well. So it, it really reminded me of this, this quote from the Bible where Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Now, context of this verse in the Bible is this is Jesus talking. He's lamenting about uh, the situation. Uh, he's lamenting about how, um, and we understand from the divine principle, what he's talking about here is that is not only that he's being attacked by people, by the Pharisees and things like that, but especially that John the Baptist was supposed to be Jesus' right-hand disciple. He's supposed to protect Jesus. He was supposed to give credibility to Jesus. He was supposed to support Jesus, not just at the beginning when he baptized him, but all throughout his ministry, all throughout his life. But Jesus was lamenting that from that time, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. This is Jesus. He's talking about his ministry, his effort to bring the kingdom of heaven has, has been difficult and forceful men, or some translations say attacking, attacking him, attacking it. And even though Jesus in this verse is talking about his ministry, I think that this is a, a very relevant topic or point for our lives today. In that when we try to force things to happen in our life, whether it's to force an agenda, as in the story I shared with you, or to force our children to, to be a certain way, to be more obedient, uh, or our, our spouse, or we try to force people to be a certain way that they're not, then we often will leave a path of destruction in our wake. And any results that may come of that, any fruit that may come of that, is not going to be genuine. It will be fake. It will be temporary. If anyone had a right to and had an idea of the way things should be and had a right to kind of force things to be a certain way, it would be God. God can see our actions, the repercussions of our actions. God knew in the, in, in the Garden of Eden that if Adam and Eve disobeyed him, that there would be long-term consequences. You know, at all these pivotal moments in history, God knew that if people went a certain direction, that there could be good consequences, there could be bad consequences. And that would also mean a lot of pain and suffering for him. 
But even still, God did not intervene. God didn't intervene to stop Adam and Eve from falling away from God. God didn't intervene when Jesus went to the cross. God didn't intervene when John the Baptist lost faith in Jesus. God didn't intervene when the Israelites lost faith in Moses. These are moments where God could have intervened, and maybe life would have been better. Maybe things could have been different. There's a part of me that thinks, well, God should have. <laughs> God should have intervened. God should have just stopped them. But um, there's a couple things here I want to share from the uh, uh, divine principle that talk a little bit about this. It says, Jesus, of course, also demonstrates that God does not interfere with a person's efforts to fulfill his portion of responsibility, but treats him according to the results of his actions. God must have known that John the Baptist and Judas Iscariot were losing their faith. He certainly had the power to stop them from sinning. Yet God did not interfere at all in their faith, but dealt with them only based on the results of their deeds. Here's a, another one. If God were to interfere with human actions during their growing period, it would be tantamount to ignoring the human portion of responsibility. In that case, God would be disregarding his own principle of creation, according to which he intends to give human beings his creative nature and raise them to become the lords of creation. And uh, maybe this is a little bit more uh, relatable uh, Reverend Moon said, God gave us our portion of responsibility as a privilege in order to bestow upon us the right to become his object partners. It is, it is a privilege which, with which even God cannot interfere. God gave us our portion of responsibility so that we could set the tr condition of participating in our own creation. So God doesn't compromise. God has a vision of what he wants his children and this world to look like. And God's not going to do anything that's going to take away from that. God's, God's not going to do anything that's going to compromise that ideal. And that also includes interfering with our decisions. Even though our decisions many times cause us, ourselves a lot of pain and suffering and, and also cause God pain and suffering and many times will even prolong God's work, God will not interfere in the decisions that we make in our life because he takes away our free will. He takes away the reality that we create our own lives. And God will not take that away from us, for better or for worse. Some people feel that, well, if God's not going to stop bad things from happening or God's not going to intervene in the world, then that means God doesn't really care or God doesn't really love us. But actually, I, I believe it's the opposite. From this perspective, we understand that actually God doesn't intervene because he loves us. God doesn't stop us because he loves us, not just to make us feel good in the moment, but because he believes in our potential, because he believes in our, our free will to create ourselves as the people that God wants us to be. It may not happen in a few years. It may not even happen in our lifetime. But in the course of our life, both here in the world and in the spirit world, that is our destination for every single human being. And God will not stop that. God will not interfere with that. If God interfered, then it wouldn't, then it wouldn't be authentic. It wouldn't be real. It would, be, it would be that God created my life, but not that I created it. I think we come across these situations sometimes in our life, especially if we have children or if we're ever in a situation as a teacher or as a mentor or um, an elder sibling or something like that, where we try to put ourselves in a situation where we try to help people make the right decisions. We try to give people good advice. We try to guide people in the, you know, don't make the same mistakes I made. You know, that's kind of a hope that we have as people who have made mistakes 
and have been around the block a couple times, these kind of things. The last thing we want to see is other people making the same mistakes and going through the same heartache that we had to go through. And we can also, because we've had those experiences, we can see that if you make this decision or if you do this thing, there's going to be, you know, X, Y, Z consequences. There's going to be X, Y, Z pain. Um, and if you see those things and you just, you don't want the other person to, to, to do it. <laughs> you, wanna, uh, you want them to make the right choice. And we can do many things. We can give good advice. We can build trust in the relationship. Um, but ultimately, we have to allow people to make their own decisions. People are going to decide what they're doing, going to do, and that's their responsibility. We can't lock them in a room to prevent them from making mistakes or for making the wrong decision or to wait until they figure things out for themselves. But it also highlights the point that since God won't force us to do anything, he will also have to work with whoever is willing to do his will. Whoever is willing to answer God's call, God will use. So God, many of you have experienced that God called you in some way or pulled you in some way. You felt some calling on your life. We have a choice. You know, we can answer that call, um, but we don't have to, and God won't force us to. But God, God's providence and God's purpose is ongoing. And if we don't say yes, then God will go and look for somebody who will. But God sets up situations. He sets up people. He sets up circumstances that are most prepared to, to do the position that God needs to be filled. He prepares people. And we see this all throughout history. We see this all throughout the Bible. We see it even in modern times that God prepares a foundation. But if those people don't want to do it, then God has to work with the next willing person. But that person may not be as, as prepared. That person may not be as capable. Um, may not be as well suited. Maybe that person's kind of forceful. I don't know. Uh, but that's not ideal, but God has no choice. I can, I can attest that, you know, there's many times where I feel like surely there would be a better person to be doing what we're doing. Um, surely there's a more capable people that could be doing like what Adoni and I do as pastors here. Um, but the reality is, you know, we said yes. And maybe there's more prepared people, better capable people, but maybe there's some comfort in the understanding that if we had said no, then God would use somebody else, but maybe they wouldn't be as well prepared or as capable. I don't know. Who can say? But I want to, you know, ask you to really consider this because kind of like the story I shared at the beginning of the message, uh, a lot of painful things can happen to people in the world and in the church and in all facets of society. And sometimes the people who are most qualified in heart to do something, we don't want to do it because we don't want to put ourselves in a situation where we're going to be hurt, where we're going to be taken for granted, where we're going to be um, taken advantage of. even though you may be the best person for it because you love people or because you really feel a passion for whatever it is you want to do. It can be easy to run away from that kind of a situation because we don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want to be put in a position to be um, of hardship. 
But, you know, please consider that God may have prepared you for that, for that, for that position, or God may have prepared you for that calling. And that if you say no, and not that you should say yes out of guilt or obligation or something like that, but if you say no, God will have to work with somebody probably way worse than you. <laughs> I don't know how to say it more um, uh, pleasantly than that. Um, and so we, we have to think about our situation, but we also have to think about God's situation, how God has had so many times to work with people who aren't really suited for the thing that he asked them to do. And many times because the people he asked couldn't follow through. John the Baptist was really well suited to be Jesus' right-hand man. He was really well suited to bring credibility to Jesus. He was really well suited to uplift Jesus. And if he, and if that could have happened, it's very possible and likely that the people of the time would have accepted Jesus. But Jesus had to take on not only his responsibility, but he also had to take on John's responsibility. He had to create his own credibility. He had to uplift himself. Instead of having, it's much easier to have someone else uplift you and to tell, you how, tell people how great you are than to walk around and try to tell everyone how great you are yourself. It's very hard to do that. Jesus ended up having to do that. So I think that many of us understand this point in theory, but in practice, many times we want something so badly. We have so much invested into our careers, into our businesses, into our families, our kids. Um, our reputation, maybe, that at the end of the day, um, it's very hard to let go of trying to make things happen the way we want them to happen. But we have to, I think at the end of the day, we can't get too hung up on that. We have to be willing to let go of the way that we think things should turn out. Um, I had this funny experience a last a few months ago where we went to Disney we went to Disney World in Florida with our kids and uh, some fam some people gave uh, us some money to buy some nice gifts for the kids which was very generous and we went down there and Annalise really wanted a baby Yoda because she we that was something that really helped us get through the COVID actually. It sounds silly, but like our whole family loved the Mandalorian. And so she just fell in love with baby Grogu. And when we went to Disney World, baby Grogu's everywhere, right? So she uh, bought, we bought her a uh, like electronic baby Grogu doll that can move. And it was, it was pretty expensive. And it has a remote control and it does all this cool stuff. And the first thing that Annalise wanted to do with the baby Yoda doll was grab the arm and run around with it by the arm. And I'm, and, and I'm like, no, you know, that's, that's going to break, you know, because the arm is, is not soft. It's like an electronic arm. It's only meant to do a few things. And so my, my like, practical mind is like, oh, she's going to break it. What a waste of money. You know, it's all this stuff. Uh, you can only buy these in Disney World. But then... Um, I kind of let it go, and I realized later that from a child's mind, she was just recreating what she saw on the TV show. If you haven't seen uh, The Mandalorian, it's a show about, it's a Star Wars show, and there's this baby Yoda, and he's kind of helpless, and so he's like, um, the, the different characters in the show are basically protecting him, and he's very cute and everything. And she just wanted to relive the the experience in the show where baby Grogu is being carried around by his arm and it's very cute. And that's all she really cared about. She didn't really care about how expensive the doll was or you know all the different things they could do. She just wanted to um, relive the baby Yoda experience in her in the real world. 
And I realized that I'm really grateful. I was really grateful that I didn't make a bigger deal out of it because, you know, if I had told her like, okay, you, you can only play with the doll a certain way. You can't use it this way. It'll break it, whatever. Then for her, it would have lost all meaning. It would have been a meaningless toy. It would have been a meaningless gift. And she wouldn't want to wanted to play with it anymore. Um, but to this day, she still loves it and plays with it. And so that's the most important thing. I don't even know if it, like, I think some parts of it aren't working. It's missing a piece of an ear. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's got paint on it. <laughs> but for her, it fulfilled the purpose for, for, you know, wanting to have it in existing. And sometimes when we are too forceful or we're too stuck on things being a certain way, we ruin it. We ruin it for ourselves. We ruin it for other people. Uh, we're not able to enjoy and live life and it, not even really able to uh, like have an authentic, given like life of faith experience. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, this is, uh, I, I just wanted to share this message today because the story that was shared with me had such an impact and I just felt that, you know, something for us to think about sometimes. Sometimes we just get so stuck on an idea stuck on things have to be a certain way but sometimes we just have to let it go sometimes we don't have control sometimes if a door closes then we just have to look for the next door to be open instead of trying to force the door open again or sitting around waiting for that door to open again and it may never open again so that's my message please join me in prayer Dearest Heavenly Parent, we are so grateful to be able to gather this morning as a family. Uh, Heavenly Parent, we really want to learn the lessons of, of people who have had to suffer through challenging uh, experiences in their life. Heavenly Parent, I pray that we can learn and we can grow. We're so grateful that even though there are so many challenges in this world. You love us so much that you will never take away our, our free will. You will never take away our, our choices, even when we make the wrong choice, Heavenly Parent, because you know that someday we are going to grow up. We're going to recognize that that wasn't maybe the best choice, but it will be our growth. It will be our decisions. It will be our uh, maturity and and over time eventually heavenly parent you know that when we really become your true children your true sons and daughters and they're standing together with you in heart that will be the real deal will be your your real children heavenly parent not uh, not something superficial not something fake but it will be a hundred percent It'll be authentic. And we know that you're waiting for that day. Wish it could come faster, and so do we. But uh, we can only do so much at this time. But we, we really pray for your continued guidance. Please continue to guide us, even, even when we don't always listen, even when we don't always see the path, Heavenly Parent. We, we really pray for your guiding hand in each and every single person's life here, in this world and all the people and all your children in it heavenly parent please continue to guide this world into the right direction we, to embody your your love and your principles and your your ideal and your hope for it and in our own lives heavenly parent when we receive the calling please give us allow us to have the strength and the the fortitude and the and the and the conviction to be able to say yes, to be able to answer your call, Heavenly Parent. I want to offer this time, this service, all the music and fellowship and prayers to you in our names as Blessed Central Families. Amen and adieu. Thank you.